Good afternoon and welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series. We greatly appreciate being with you every week. We always learn a lot uh, through your questions. We've got a very full program as usual, so let's get right into it with uh, first just covering a couple of housekeeping items. We've been thinking a lot about optimizing your town hall experience and just a couple of tips here. Please do maximize your content window. Uh, we're going to have both video and, and slides today. And also for mobile viewers, you can click on the camera button in the upper right hand corner and that will activate uh, the camera for the mobile experience. At the end of today's show, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, uh, but we've improved the registration process and starting next week, you're going to be able to register for the, the town hall series and then you will not have to register on a weekly basis. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. You can earn CPE. You just need to answer 75% of the pop-ups during today's presentation. And at the end of the presentation, you can click on the CPE button there to get your CPE certificate. But don't worry if you don't receive it, then you will receive an email with instructions. And finally, you can download the materials uh, by clicking on that orange button. There also are other uh, materials beyond just the presentation, uh, our FAQs, and please do ask questions. So first, I'm Eric Auskerson, the CEO and president of, of CPA.com, AICPA's business and technology subsidiary. And with me today uh, are Barry, who you all know, and no one's got uh, their finger on the pulse of the profession better than Barry. And he's gonna be providing us uh, a lot of perspective on the state of the firms today. Also joining us is Marty Mucci, uh, and he actually uh, is one of the leaders of, of small businesses here in America as the, as the CEO of Paychex, and he's going to be bringing us some very interesting insights on the current climate uh, with the small business marketplace. And then we also have a couple of our AICPA leaders, Mark Peterson, he's going to give an update uh, from Washington, D.C. on the state of the current legislation. Uh, that's being worked through uh, Congress, the, the the Skinny Heroes Act, and then Lisa is going to end today's presentation and cover some of the the latest uh, resources and and tools that we're putting in place for firms. So here's our agenda. I'm going to kick it off uh, with Barry and Marty after I make some brief comments just uh, about the overall kind of strategic direction of firms and our stakeholders, and then after Marty and Barry, we're going to have uh, Mark and Lisa joining us. So first off, I just want to share this slide once again. Uh, what we do every week is we are connecting with all of the stakeholders and we're bringing you the latest information. Once again, this has been a very, very active week and we've been speaking with governmental officials, the, the payroll and lending community and, and the firms. And it's really been an incredible six months and we're gonna be reflecting a little bit about that six months with, with Marty and Barry. And now we're continuing to think about what's going on with the firms related to the trusted advisor role that they're playing with their small business clients. And what we're seeing is it's really all three of these activities. We're continuing to see more and more operating restrictions throughout the country. And these are things that firms are speaking to their clients about the business relief activities, uh, the PPP forgiveness program. And just as importantly, there's more and more discussion going on between the firms and their clients around the overall business model. And there's so much business creation that is, that is occurring due to all of this disruption. It is just critically important that the firms do think more about that with their clients. And we're going to have some comments uh, from Marty and Barry on that as well. So what are the hot topics this week? Um, in many of the past town halls, we've been highlighting business shutdowns. What we're highlighting here in this first article is a surge in business startups. Over the weekend, uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, ran an article that highlighted that the business startups are at the highest level since post the 2007 and 2008 uh, recession. They're actually up 20% year over year. And then we've all been seeing all the discussion around the business stimulus package. Uh, we'll be talking about that. And then finally, the most read article right now online on the Wall Street Journal, believe it or not, is about the processing of the forgiveness applications. 
Only 2% have been submitted to the SBA so far. Uh, and there's a lot of anxiety on what's happening with those forgiveness applications. Uh, what is happening is that they are going to start processing them at the SBA. And we'll be talking about that. But now I'd like to bring Barry and Marty on and start our discussion about the state of the firms and state of businesses in America. So welcome, Barry and Marty. Thanks, Eric. Good to be here. So Marty, I want to kick it off with you. Um, and you've got 700,000, close to 700,000 business clients. You're always on Squawk Box with your, your quarterly reports. And I want to get into some of your, your current data. But before we do, I want you to reflect back a little bit on what this past six months has meant to you and your small business clients and in your team there at Paychex. I actually remember uh, on March 21st, that Saturday, speaking with you when we were standing up the coalition and your leadership uh, played a huge role. You were one of the first companies that said, yeah, we, we want to support this, this coalition. We want to help small businesses. That's when our journey began um, and so much has occurred. So I'd welcome you providing your, your perspective on that. Well, as it's been overused, it's, it's certainly unprecedented times. You know, Paychex uh, will celebrate 50 years in business uh, next year. So we've been around small and mid-sized businesses uh, for a long time and have evolved with them. And of course, our relationship uh, with the AICPA and CPA.com has is, is been uh, quite long as well. And we really appreciate being here today and, uh, and also being uh, in part of that partnership with you. You're right. We got together immediately. Uh, I think it really helped that coalition uh, between you and, and, uh, and us and many others to get down to Washington right away and say that small businesses needed help. Uh, I think what we've seen is that the first uh, package really did uh, produce a lot of stimulus. It really did help a lot. Uh, in, uh, but the, and you're finding out how much it helped because there's such a, a cry for the second uh, package that would really help with continued loans. The loans have been critical. They're at the point now where they're kind of coming to the end of their loans. Uh, the most recent articles are, I think, 80% are reaching the end of the loans uh, from the first program, PPP program. And, uh, and over 50% of small businesses would look, are looking for a second loan. So it's really critical. And, and uh, the time is really critical that uh, that they start to get them. So it's uh, it's been a very challenging time, although you've said, you mentioned something very interesting uh, that we've seen as well, which is the 20% increase in startups of businesses. Uh, I mentioned that on Squawk Box uh, this week, and I think they were very surprised. And what's happening is that Wall Street Journal article gave it the, discretion, the description of it, more are starting new businesses. You know, if you were in a train, if you were a trainer, and you can't get people to come into the gym anymore, uh, you start fixing bikes now because people are riding bikes and doing things like that. So amazing resiliency in small business uh, is what we're seeing, but still tough out there. Yeah, well, well thanks, Marty. And I think, I mean, the firms here, you know, they're doing business relief and, and in some cases they have to do bankruptcy filings. In other cases, they gotta help these businesses that are that are just uh, redoing their, their business model. One thing I just, and I'm gonna go to Barry, but what, uh, your team, has provided a lot of insights uh, over the past six months. One person I know that we've we've got uh, behind the scenes here is Frank Ferrielli, who's the VP of Risk and uh, Compliance there. And if there's a technical question that comes up, we may we may call on him. So Barry, uh, just just you know thinking about you know the firms you've been talking. I mean we're all working remote, um, but you've probably spoken uh, to firms more over the past six months than you've you've spoken at any time during your career. So. Why don't you reflect a little bit on that before we get into more about today's climate? And Barry, we got you. Someone got you on mute there. We got to unmute you. There we go. Thank there you. you. Go. And thank you for hosting this program for us all these many months now, six months. It's hard to believe that it's been through that time. And, you know, I think the profession has, has handled the situation extraordinarily well and also demonstrated um, an incredible amount of agility in being able to do that. We talk a lot about in, in, in the coalition that Marty talked about, you know, the, the number one point on that was you have to, as a federal government, support small business. 
And there's no one a better position than the CPA profession to be part of that solution for small business. And, you know, we talk about 700,000 clients at, at paycheck, then, you know, almost every one of those has a CPA relationship. And I think the profession, the leaders of firms of every size, you know, obviously there was a lot of concern day one, what's going to happen to my clients, what's going to happen to my workforce, uh, what, what kind of services that our clients are going to really want. And, you know, sometimes our profession in history has been, you know, given some stereotypical images about ourselves, but we showed incredible agility and our members in business and industry the same way to help businesses survive. And so, um, you know, the use of cloud based solutions and technology, adapting the work from from home provisions, we almost miss no beat in that environment as a profession. And as the issues of the day have evolved, I think the reputation of the profession, which is obviously incredibly high, is actually been enhanced. Uh, and firms have built relationships with clients they probably couldn't have imagined even seven or eight months ago. And I think also part of what the coalition is about and what these town halls are about is a reflection of how you build with your firm relationships in your business environment that also help your client. And if, if we've done nothing else with this town hall series, I think we've reinforced that. So I think firms will do very well. I think the message to young people will be, look how well the profession did and how purpose-driven the profession is. And, and that purpose really is about what I would say is being the equivalent of the medical profession on the health side, but the profession for the health of the economy. And I think we've delivered on that very, very well. Barry, and I, when, I, when I look back in the past six months to today, and what I, what I, feel is that we now are really ready for the second phase of business relief because even on day one back there in early April, um, we worked on building out. We did have some ecosystem relationships in place, but we needed to build up some additional relationships with the lending community. And the good news is, I think we have expanded our ecosystem. I know the firms have. I know the firms had some frustrations uh, with with some of their their different ecosystem partners. And I think they've, they've focused on improving them. And it is very, very important because it is complex. Uh, all of these different information sources, be it calculating the payroll correctly, um, understanding the other obligations that went into the PPP program. Uh, these are things that needed the, the firms to stand up and lead and be relevant uh, for their clients, as well as the other, other members of the ecosystem. So, no question, Eric. And just one last point on that. I think when you think about in that where you're bringing value as a profession, being able to use those relationships that are being brought forward, the tools that are being brought forward and, and, and really reinforcing the notion that the value of this trusted advisor activity is about the bigger picture business sustainability or survivability, which is critical to our, our world, to our economy. And that's, I think really where uh, the vast majority of CPAs have shined and, and actually done, uh, you know, focus. Yeah, and I think we're very energized. I think we're very energized. We have a purpose, a lot of relevancy. So Marty, in your, so let's let's move a little bit uh, to the current environment. You've got some, I know you, you talked about your, your September uh, business focus data. So why don't you share some of that with us? Sure. I think what we've seen, obviously, we saw a great uh, drop off. We have uh, the Paychex uh, IHS market, a small business index that we've done for about six years now on a monthly basis. So, of course, one of the biggest drops you can imagine uh, from pretty much February to March and April uh, in, the, in the huge drop off that we saw in the jobs. The interesting thing is that with that huge dr uh, drop in job, we have now seen them start to add back. And so jobs are coming back. Uh, slowly, we're also seeing hours worked uh, come up. And I'm sure many of you, the firms are seeing that the hours worked. You know, I think small businesses are trying to get the most out of the, the employees they have and try to add back other employees slowly. They are trying to keep those employees so that they don't leave. So they're, they're kind of suspending them right now. Uh, so they're keeping them on the payroll and, uh, and hopefully they're getting unemployment benefits. That was particularly important during the time when they were enhanced, the employment, the unemployment benefits. And uh, so we're seeing employees being added back and more being paid. Mm -hmm. The South continues to be the strongest part of the U.S. Uh, and construction is the strongest sector. You know, I think you may have seen new sales of new homes 
residential homes are up 40% from last year at this time. So it's an amazing time for residential uh, builds as well as commercial building right now, even though office space you'd expect is slipping a little bit. There's a lot of construction going on. And of course, a lot of small businesses come around construction uh, as well. So I'd say the South is the strongest. The wages are coming back over 3%. The hours worked are up in the South. The South and construction uh, are the are the heaviest from an industry sector. So still hoping for a complete bounce back. You know, job growth is down significantly, obviously still from last year, but we are seeing a steady growth uh, in jobs coming back uh, over the last few months in particular. And, and Barry, just, you know, you, you I remember the discussions back in April and May with the firms and, and where the firms are now, it, 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 that, that, that uptick that, that Marty's seen with the small business community, it, it feels like we're seeing that with uh, the firm market as well. There's no question that is true. And clearly those startups that Marty talks about, um, you know, that's, that's a huge potential value proposition for a CPA relationship to help that business, not just think about compliance, but their business model and how they can, re you know, we know small, a high percentage of small businesses do not make it through a three or a five year uh, cycle, even more difficult in today's environment, probably. And so I think, I think that sort of relationship is important, but to be honest, there are still some things out there that we have to be concerned about, I think as a country and as an economy, and, and those are playing out. I mean, we will see probably in some big companies, airlines potentially, uh, some big unemployment issues, depending on how government support comes about. Um, Marty's right, the construction side of things is still very hot. How long can that continue? Uh, that that is truly driven by the ability to have employment in the, in the economy. And, you know, that's why it's very important that the government programs focus on small business. Small business provides more than 50 percent of the employment base of this country. And that's been our message from day one to government. This is different than a bailout of a big industry vertical. This is about making sure we have small business that can move forward. Um, and then I do think from a CPA profession perspective, the leaders of firms of all different sizes have a bit of what will 2021 look like? How long is this sustainable? Can it reverse out? Will we have a, you know, a second wave from a medical perspective, all legitimate issues. And I think from the profession's public interest issue, there is also the issue of some of the valuations that will be in play on, on financial institution balance sheets and, you know, how much collectability is there on rent payments and whether that's, residential rental or, or commercial properties, all of those things will start to play out in a much bigger way as we move into 2021 and how they're handled, how our government handles them, how we handle them as a profession will probably be a huge indicator of what 2021 will feel like. Yeah, I do think, you know, Eric, if I could jump in, I think the other thing I think the firms will see and they've already seen tremendously and because uh, CPAs, you know, have been so important to paychecks in our history. We've seen the growth in HR support, you know, for small and mid-sized businesses. There's so much confusion now from an HR perspective and such an opportunity from the CPA firms to support them in HR as does paychecks. That has been the fastest growing part of paychecks for the last three years and particularly the last six months because they need to understand, you know, how do what do I do with my team? Do I furlough them? Do I lay them off? bringing them back? How do I bring them back, uh, you know, safely? How do I handle OSHA requirements? How do I handle all of the COVID health assessments? And we've produced a number of tools uh, and forms and electronic tools to be able to let them do that through our products and also to be able to support the CPA community and giving them that support as well. We have a hotline, HR hotline support line just for accountants. We have, of course, our accountant HQ, which is a place for them to see all of their clients in one place. Also, all, everything is online. Everything is paperless from a reporting standpoint and all the data analytics that are there, you know, as well. We're also seeing a very interesting trend, which you would expect, uh, a very big pickup in household employers. Uh, so picking up nannies, tutors, those kind of th uh, businesses are now looking for payroll and outsourcing for the first time. So they're going to look to the accounting community uh, for support and how do I pay someone for the first time? How do I set up a contract? How do I hire someone and how do I uh, handle that? Uh, you know, they're coming to us for payroll and HR support, unemployment insurance, things like that, workers' comp insurance. But it's a very fast growing trend now with children staying home from school or daycare. It's 
very interesting right now, fast growing. And I think that's an example of firms uh, building new competencies that they might not have had before. I mean, that, that's one of several, but I think it's a very important one because again, that employment is so critical and the more that businesses can survive and provide that employment, but there are others. I think firms have built supply chain capabilities and understanding because businesses need help in that much more so than they might have a year or so ago. And, and, and so that was a great, I think, point of, of showing where firms have be, you know, become more expert in a, in a, a wider variety of areas. Yeah, ab absolutely. We're seeing, you know, great growth in, in many things that we've been talking, we've been speaking about over the past few years. One is it's, it's cloud computing or using uh, outsourced services. It's focusing on being able to deliver remotely uh, virtual CFO, client accounting services, and then finally that, that advisory element. And I think one thing that we learned as 5 million businesses applied for PPP is having, having done things right, make uh, processes like this flow much, much smoother. I mean, we know people found out that they weren't doing their payroll holdings correctly. Uh, and that, that caused a lot of frustrations uh, with some small businesses that were applying for, for PPP loans. What, what I'm going to bring up before we we're going to bring up the slide uh, and talk a little bit about uh, at a high level what's happening in Washington DC. But before we do that, why don't we just continue on with this topic about this new operating environment? I mean, how are you? What are you seeing as changes in, in on, on how your business clients are functioning? Uh, what big shifts are occurring, Marty? Yeah, Eric, it's a it's a big shift towards self service. You know, uh, with with most of their employees being remote. Uh, it has really accelerated probably three to four years the need to uh, use things like mobile apps, uh, a number of new uh, features and products that we have where you can instant message your employees back and forth. You can send them documents. You can have them sign uh, you know, electronically for all kinds of documents. If you onboard a brand new uh, employee today, what people are doing, many businesses are never seeing them in person. So they need all of the recruiting tools from uh, being able to hire them, have them sign all the forms electronically, have them get training uh, electronically. All these that Paychex provides has become a very fast growing part of our business. And also a very much a need on the SaaS from a cloud standpoint and a mobile standpoint uh, is being able to uh, have them do self-service. So in the old days, you know, Paychex would take care of everything for you. If you have an address change, your employee fills out the paperwork, hands it to their payroll administrator and sends it to us. All of that is gone now. It's all you give your employee the mobile app for paychecks. They can go in, update everything, update their bank account information, their addresses, you know, get information and send it. So it's it's really gone much more to self-service. Everyone wants to do them things themselves. Uh, no paper. And it's become much more efficient, frankly. And our help uh, source also our our. Uh, website with all of our help center gives not only the employers and the employees information, but also the CPA firms as well. You know, it's, as I mentioned, it's been a very good relationship and it's something it's important to us to work in partnership with the firms to be sure that we're helping them as much as possible. Even with the latest is our forgiveness uh, estimator. You know, we were the first to come out with a loan forgiveness estimator for the PPP loans. And uh, now that has turned into a where you can produce a signature ready electronically, of course, signature ready application that can be filed for the loan. You got to make things easier for these businesses and for the CPA community to support uh, both of them. So it's it's been a very big trend, but it has accelerated unbelievably in the last six months. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think we're seeing that uh, across the firms as well is how do they support their remote staff with the right tools, even though many of the firms are going back to the office. So there's there's it's a it's a, it's a mixed environment. Why don't, Barry, unless you want to comment on that, you want us to bring bring up the policy making regulatory activities. Yeah, if you could bring it up, I'll just add one quick point. Okay. I, I think that, um, again, the profession has adapted, for instance, to doing audits remotely and, and approving that that is a capability, which a lot of people maybe in February would have said you couldn't do that. Um, and I, there is a mix. I think the profession will probably permanently have a, a bigger mix of work from home and remote than it did, let's say, in February. Um, I do think Marty talked about the economy doing better in the South. I do think there's a geographic element to where people are back to work and not back to work. I think. It, frankly, you know, smaller cities, 
Um, certainly more firms are back to the office a good bit, but I think overall the footprint, let's call it the real estate footprint of firms will be smaller and the remote activities will be larger, much like a lot of their clients, but the types of services that firms traditionally do, I think that that will probably be a permanent change, not all the way, but it will, that mix will have shifted and that, that shift will be permanent. And Eric, one other thing I think is they do bring them back to work. Now, those that are going back to an office environment, you know, they're really going to need uh, the accountant's help, uh, paychecks help to say, how do I bring them back safely? What tools do I have? We've just, you know, been dealing with a number of clients the last two months that are using our time clocks. We have an iris scan time clock and we produced that, you know, uh, some months ago and started introducing that. But now with face masks, it's very important. So you can go up, look, just look into the time clock to punch yeah. in and punch out. But, and also giving them on our Paychex mobile app, you have the ability to do health assessments. So just like at Paychex and probably at your firms as well, we're checking in every day, signing off electronically, uh, you know, on our mobile app saying, yes, you know, we're all set, we're healthy. And before we can go into the building, that has to be done. You can do that with our mobile app, which also can be used then for reports to OSHA or any other COVID reporting. So it, there's a whole new set of opportunities as you've talked about uh, for the accountant and for places like Paychex. Absolutely, I mean, those three areas, it's, it's, it's operating restrictions, you're noting some of them, it's business relief. And we're saying that we're gonna talk about this at the end of today's webinar about how it's gonna go on to 20, into 2021 and 2022. The business relief is gonna stay with us. And then finally, just the, the adjustments uh, to the business model and all of the trusted advisor work around that. So why don't we bring up the slide um, and you we, you can get your crystal balls out here and we can talk a little bit about where this is going. Mark Peterson will be joining us in a moment. Uh, here, this is just, we all know what's happened uh, since since the CARES Act. You had the HEROES Act from the, the, the House, then you had the HEALS Act from the Senate, then we had some other compromise ideas that were put out and now we've got "Quote unquote," this the skinny heroes act. Every day, Mnuchin's, uh He's a, he he really wants to get something done. So Barry, I'll, and next week, just let everyone know. Next week, we're going to have Congresswoman Fle Congresswoman Fletcher on, who's been very supportive of one of the big items for us, and that's the the, the deductibility of expense items. I'm hoping we'll be talking to her about a pass a, a bill that's almost passed. But Barry, why don't you reflect a little bit on this, and then then I'll, I'll have I'll have Marty. Well, well, I guess I guess my number one point here would be is that uh, things are not necessarily like they appear to be. Uh, I mean, and including maybe even progress. And I know, Eric, you're a foreign believer. This is this is a, not a question of of um, of if, but when. And I would I would generally agree with that. But I think, look, we're in a, a heightened election period of time. We have a very polarized government, and a maybe you could say a polarized. Uh, constituency of a, of a country. And most people agree, like for instance, on the deductibility issue, I think there's pretty wide agreement on that. And if there is a bill, there will probably be something that actually, you know, addresses that issue. But I think the, the, the reality is, is that there is a piece of this that will be about political posturing and people making political assessments. That's a bit unfortunate because small business, particularly with a PPP2 type of con concept, is in such desperate need of that next wave. And I'm sure the airlines would say the same thing and the hotels would say the same thing, but the, the fact of the matter, that's a huge need. But just as you listen to the news over the next 48 hours, and Mark will speak more on this, but as you see things happening, votes do not necessarily mean things will get passed in both houses. Uh, you know, gaps will be, still need to be sort of brought together. I think there's a pretty high likelihood the house will go home even if they vote and you know whether we will get something that you can talk about next week will be whether or not they come back, whether or not they have another vote from that standpoint. So it's it's a real murky uh, environment, I would say, unfortunately, from a business support perspective. The other hand is it will ultimately get done. The need will be will be critical. And I guess to the CPAs, it's important to help your clients find a way through this time frame until that help does get done. And I, I think that that's, that's back to that trusted advisor role. I think that's a very good point. Anything that can be done in the short term, because as I mentioned earlier, 
you know, I think you're seeing probably 80% of the businesses get to the end of their loans from the first PPP uh, process. And uh, over 50%, as I said, you know, need that second loan, at least that number uh, from what we've seen from our surveys. And it's really going to be critical. It, you know, it's, it's such an important time. We've learned so much from the first stimulus package. I think we learned that the loans should be more flexible. They should be over longer periods of time. The reporting should be easier. I think on the unemployment boost, yeah, you know, it doesn't need to be $600. It, sh it could be 400 or 200, you know, something because that did cause some difficulties that we heard from small businesses, even hiring back employees that were better off on unemployment. So we've learned a lot from the first st stimulus. And it's really a shame if we can't uh, have Congress get together and, and agree on a second one that can be even more focused on businesses and where that money needs to go. And uh, and anything that the CPA community community paychecks and any coalition, Eric, that yeah. you know, we can get together on to push this uh, is more than worth it in my mind. Well, we're still, the coalition, we're still working. I mean, your team's working, we're still working. The voices are loud. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough climate uh, in DC right now, but the data point you just provided of, and, and you've got good data, 50% of the businesses needing yeah. this second round. I mean, we talked about, you know, there's businesses being created, but there's a lot of businesses that are that are in trouble and need the second round. And I think what we it is we're continuing to. It's a question of of uh, when, and if it doesn't happen over the next couple of weeks, you know, it seems like there's a very good chance it'll happen, you know, in in mid November. And that's one thing I think, Barry, that was great insights there. You know, how do you bridge from now to maybe mid November? Uh, you know, delay some payments, and then all of us need to be ready to process those applications because there's probably not going to be enough money. So it's going to be important for the firms and the ecosystem to be ready to take care of their clients. Barry? Yeah, I, I think Marty's point on the unemployment is real as well. I mean, the 600 versus some smaller amount. I, I was speaking to one of our members who's the CEO of a small business, not on a firm. And, and just the frustration because he said he's spoken to mem con congressional members from his state just yesterday and how they don't get that sort of how that works to create that problem. And so it, it remains an education issue. The other thing I would say in thinking about how your clients will, will play out when, when, the, uh, when, the, it, the, when the help does occur is that there, we, they will be different than the first round. So for instance, I think there will be potentially some outright grant capabilities that will go through the process. So that'll be different even from an accounting perspective. I think there will be uh, certainly more tests in who can get a loan. So there'll be some type of revenue comparative test. That'll probably be, be absolute. The, the things that Marty talked about that, you know, extended times, that probably will be there. Um, and, you know, frankly, depending on how much comes into that, we could go through another, uh, you know, a, another speed warp because I think some of the money is going to be apportioned into different buckets so there'll probably be a 501c6 bucket and they might be a bucket that's focused on different types of businesses. You know, for instance, restaurants might be a separate category. And so it won't be as, as much of a big pot and everybody going after it. It'll be more strategic. And I think thinking about that as CPAs and, and your client mix, as that starts to evolve will be very important. And Barry, there's just going to be a, a, a bigger role, actually, probably for the trust advisor role in the second round, based on what you said, than even the first round. There'll be flexibility, but there's going to be all these other conditions that you need to take into account. Well, Marty, I, I want to ask you, uh, you know, one one final final question here. And I, before I do that, just just thank you. I mean, I, it was it was that was that I was a Saturday, and uh, we connected on a Saturday, and we got some important messages delivered uh, to Washington D.C. to our policymakers prior to the CARES Act being passed. And then it is, it's been this partnership uh, through the last six months that have helped us do what we've done. Uh, so thank you, thanks, thanks for your partnership. And I would just like to ask you, as you look into uh, 21, 22, any, any just broader perspective uh, for the audience here? Well, I think it's, you know, the business community, small and mid-sized in particular businesses in the US have been very resilient. and. Uh, 
this is a environment that actually with low interest rates, you look at how strong construction is, as we talked about, and that is very even, it is very regional as well in the US. You can't paint a picture of the entire US. I think there's great opportunity for a real comeback here in the economy as people get more comfortable. There's gonna be a lot of pent up demand and it's gonna be uh, particularly from, I think the CPA community preparing their clients, believe it or not, for that comeback. You know, are you prepared? Are you gonna have enough capacity to handle the demand? Because there's gonna be a lot of pent up demand, I think for travel, for recreation, for a lot of different things. And it's been very uh, exciting actually to see the, the bounce in new business starts as we talked about earlier in the call. So uh, I think it, it, we have a lot of, we, I think it's gonna be a little bit of a bumpy start to 21 uh, as we're still coming out of this and the vaccine and so forth. But I think then you'll find that people are very anxious to get out and get out and do things. And those businesses that plan for that and have the support through their trusted advisor are gonna do really well. And if you can bottle what Marty just said as a CPA firm, because part of our role as CPAs is to help people see the light at the end of that tunnel. Right. And if you could bottle that optimism and that, that notion and help clients think about that, that in and of itself will go a big way in helping 2021 actually meet the objectives that Marty just said. Right. Well, Barry, that's a perfect close. Uh, you're gonna be joining us uh, at, at, during open forum, so you'll have a chance to make uh, additional remarks. Marty, thanks for your insights today. And we look forward to potentially having you in another town hall down the road. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Barry. Appreciate the partnership. Take good, care. Now. Good being with you, Marty. Thank you. All right. So now we're going to bring uh, Mark Peterson up. And uh, Mark, so you, they, as usual, we always had to maybe steal a little bit of your uh, of your information. <laughs> so why don't you uh, uh, fill in uh, some of the gaps and, and just give your your thinking on this skinny uh, heroes act? Got to get, got to get all these names correct. Yeah. Well, there's a little product moving through the system. It's not made it to the finish line, but it, it Barry actually teed it up nicely. I, I've got a few more details for you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, two point tr two trillion dollars. It's it's going to right now. It is a partisan package, um, but it contains some big stuff for us. And I think directionally, that's it's a that's a good thing. Um, uh, extending PPP, uh, but as Barry mentioned, targeted smaller smaller loans, maybe you know two hundred fifty thousand dollars smaller companies, uh, less than 200 employees, uh, you have to show 25% uh, uh, loss in, in revenue. Um, you know, they're gonna, there's gonna be some limitations on, on uh, franchises. Uh, obviously, uh, you don't anticipate public companies being able to, to, to get that. Uh, forgiveness, we continue, continue to see this drumbeat on forgiveness. Um, you know, the number that we've been discussing is $150,000 and below that streamlining some level of forgiveness. This latest package, the one that, that could be considered today, has kind of tiers, you know, up to $50,000. You basically get to certify it through the, the uh, SBA, uh, 50 to 100. You still have to work with your lender. Uh, and then when you get over there, it, over that, it does start to uh, ask for more requirements related to forgiveness. Deductibility is in. That's something All that right. we're pushing hard. 501c3, uh, excuse me, c6 money in. That's good. Uh, just a couple of other things. Um, you know, Barry mentioned sectors and grants, $120 billion for uh, treasury grants to restaurants. Uh, some some money for the airlines, second round of stimulus checks, and then another round of, of plus up unemployment insurance. Having said all that, um, the vote that happens today does not mean that that's what the president's going to sign. Um, it is a negotiation. If there is a vote today, it likely will be a partisan vote uh, because they have not negotiated it to where it needs to be to make it through the Senate and ultimately uh, to the president to be signed. I think as this plays out, there's a couple things to watch. What happens today, and then uh, how is that received by the Senate? You know, right now, the Senate leadership is not interested in this package, but negotiations are ongoing. And when they leave, when the House leaves, um, they're going to say they can come back in 24 hours and negotiations will continue. So there is the possibility that they could uh, come back to try and get something done here between now and the election. Post-election is lame duck. Historically, 
Um, the things that happen in lame duck are fairly non-controversial and usually fairly small. And so they could do some rifle shot things in the lame duck session. I don't think it would be a big relief package. And then you're looking at going over uh, into next year when the, um, when the new Congress is sworn in. And then I think you have more of a chance of a larger package. Um, however, I think it will be substantially different in shape than what we've been looking at because there will be different people in charge at that time potentially well mark that you know we could we could we could keep going for for the for the next 20 minutes uh, and probably beyond that uh discussing all of those different permutations so we'll we'll be uh you'll, your team will be watching this uh we'll be keeping people up to date on social media and clearly uh we'll be ready uh with a, a full update uh, for next week's town hall, when we have uh, Congresswoman Fletcher on, so so thanks, Mark. A lot more, a lot more to come next week. So well, again, and again, just real quickly, Eric, this is one of a number of packages where we've worked really hard to get initiatives like deductibility in, streamlining forgiveness. You know, the list goes on, and so we need a better outcome, but but we are seeing positive um, provisions in these bills. Yeah, the bill looks excellent. I mean, this bill, and that's what we said. We said it. You know, if you want to reach out to to your elected officials, please do, because this bill looks like something that could really help business America and help the economy. Uh, so, Mark, we're going to now we'll pivot. We'll bring you back to open forum. We're going to jump to Lisa. Lisa's got, as usual, uh, Lisa Simpson is back, um, and uh, she's got a number of uh, slides to cover. So, Lisa, I'll let you just uh, get right into it. Hey everybody, I missed you guys last week. Hope you had a, a, a good town hall. We're gonna go through these first few slides quickly, um, but as a reminder, you can always go back and check an archive version if you see a topic here that you want to um, that you missed or you wanna replay. Then if we go to the next slide, we always like to make sure that you know how to find um, some of the answers to our most frequently asked questions. The FAQs that are referenced here are in your materials and are available for download. If for some reason you cannot locate that, you'll find them um, on the website, unfortunately without the handy reference numbers, but you'll find them on that um, AICPA.org forward slash SBA. On this slide, we've talked about um, PPP fund deductibility. We've talked about legislation. As you know, it's still a priority. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, filing a tax return and deducting expenses a little later. One of the ones, uh, topics I wanted to dig into a little bit more today was around FTE reductions. And how does that work if you're applying for forgiveness before the end of the covered period? Last week, I think Carrie gave you a, a, a insight that we had gotten from some of our lender coalition partners that basically said, according to the SBA, that when the borrower applies for forgiveness, um, even if it's early, if they've used all of their funds and um, they were applying for forgiveness, their FTE requirement stops. So uh, some language that I got is that when a borrower submits the completed application and a lender has processed that application, then the, lend the borrower is no longer bound to FTE restrictions. Um, I do not have that in an IFR. I do not have that in an FAQ, but we have had a couple of lenders tell us that those are the, that's the answer they've gotten from the SBA as they're trying to process forgiveness applications. So, so real simply, after you submit your forgiveness application, if you need to make adjustments to, to your payroll, uh, you, you're free to do that. Yes. So we're also getting lots of questions about, um, is it time to apply now for forgiveness? So we thought we'd just throw out a list of the items that you probably need to be talking with your client about, or if you're the, the business owner, uh, these are the things to consider. You got to start with, have you spent the full amount of PPP funds? If you're trying to sell the business, as you've heard Eric um, mention, there's a lot of, of push if there's a sale transaction or a change in ownership to um, try to go ahead and get that loan off the books. And lenders that we've spoken to are generally trying hard to work with borrowers in those circumstances. I think a big question that, you, that we've talked about all, all day today is what's that threshold for simplified forgiveness? And is your client or are you as a borrower 
willing to go ahead and dive into the forgiveness process if there's a chance that it might get simplified for you at a later date. So just something to think about, Mark Peterson hit the highlights here. Tax planning around deductibility of expenses is a significant um, conversation point, and Ed Carl did a great job of covering that in his August 20th town hall appearance. You can find the archive version at um, AICPA.org slash SBA. We give you a link to all of those archives. Uh, Eric stole my thunder. Do you need to um, reduce your headcount because of it? it's a business operating decision? Then um, that that's something that's going to come into play. We understand businesses have to continue to to make tough decisions. Another is simply an appetite for debt on the books. Um, are there loan covenants that need to be considered, or are you having conversations with your lender about the possibility of that loan still being on the book? And is your lender accepting applications? We are hearing um, from our conversations with lenders more and more are accepting applications. They are doing them in waves and they are waiting to hear back from the SBA. So they've submitted um, some applications for the SBA and with the conversations we've had eight, even two hours ago, none of them had gotten anything. You know, there's pressure to get that. Moving. Yeah, and Lisa, as we said, the two top reasons why people are applying for forgiveness are the sale of the business and now that they make operating decisions that may include the FTE reductions. Uh, so that's that, that's driving the two percent. But the lenders are all saying they're they're not. There's not a lot of lot of uh, applications being submitted right now. So that's a that's a very small group of businesses that are you know doing forgiveness applications for those two reasons. One quick point about our conversations with lenders: they are um, having to go back and forth with the borrowers to finalize to get everything they feel like they need to submit the applications to the SBA, they are anxiously awaiting to get back from the SBA um, those first wave of applications so that they can fine tune their processes and communicate more effectively with the next wave of borrowers who are online. So that's another thing to consider. Um, I'm not gonna go over this in detail, but um, in reviewing questions from last week, it appears there are still quite a few questions around FTE reductions. Uh, you've got this in your um, notes, in your materials, but, so we'll sw um, switch over to the next one because the next slide is about our safe harbors. The, the first safe harbor is the one about operating restriction. And again, it seems like there, there might be a little bit of confusion or um, trying to, to read too much into the, the details of the um, information that was presented by the SBA and Treasury. But that first safe harbor is almost, um, it, it's a way to say that I was impacted by COVID and I had to reduce the number of hours or the, reduce the number of employees. And it is, I think what's catching people off guard is that it says due to compliance with regulations or requirements established by HHS, CDC, OSHA. And if we slip, um, flip to the next slide, it's really about, I'm in, I'm in North Carolina. North Carolina has not been um, subject to a federal mandate to close down, but there have been local government or those local government orders do count for this FTE safe harbor. So if, if you were ordered to shut down by a local ordinance, that, that applies. If your business activity was reduced, compared to your activity prior in the year, or if you're seasonal the previous year, then you've satisfied this safe harbor and any reduction in FTEs will not um, reduce your forgiveness. You do have to maintain records. Uh, the, there is no hard and fast uh, guidance that I've seen about what that documentation is. But this is a really important safe harbor. And um, it, it's our understanding that lenders are looking at it generously and that the SBA and Treasury will be looking at it generally. Well, thank, thanks, Lisa, and stay, stay with me here. Uh, we're just gonna cover a couple of uh, slides here on the tools and, and, and one on .cpa, then we're gonna do the open forum. There's a lot of good questions coming in. But this slide just summarizes you know, what we've uh, reviewed over the past six months. It's a lot of information. It's over 400 pages. 
of, of information related to, to the, the PPP Act and the, the IFRs and FAQs. So there's lots of uh, facts that go into um, completing the forgiveness application. And we, what we have done is in the early stages, we, we gave you PDF documents, and then we moved to a, a calculator, forgiveness calculator. And now we've got a full uh, business relief tool. And the reason why is because that's, that's what is really needed to do this effectively, just like you use tax software to do tax returns. At this point, I mean, Lisa Simpson's got pretty much it all in her head, but she's she's got a team below her and they focus on it all the time. But it's it's better to leverage a platform that incorporates all of this guidance and then allow you to play the advisory role. So here's basically how we see this tool for firms. It's good to have a centralized application where you can support uh, many client applications and interfaces to the different banks. Uh, yes, the banks are going to have their own platforms, but the banks are interested in receiving uh, these source documents and, and, and potentially a completed 3508. So we covered that in depth last week, um, and there's lots of information about this at uh, I, the, the, I think the URL, it, it's on our SBA site, the AICPA.org SBA site, but it's uh, cpaloanportal.com. Uh, uh, and there's, there's videos there. And we did a 30 minute overview of that last week. Once again, it's about all of these different bu business relief options. It's not just about PPP. We're going to be having a, an expert on idle join us in a couple of weeks. Uh, and we're absolutely going to be ready uh, to discuss any new legislation that passes. And we'll focus on that next week if that, if that occurs. Just want to remind everybody that we're now in the final uh, 30 days of this early application period for .CPA. Uh, the interest is high. Over 60% of MFG now has registered. 80% are in the process of doing that. That's a large firm group. Uh, thousands of firms are taking advantage of this. This is a hard deadline, October 31st, to leverage your existing uh, digital brand as part of your application. You will be guaranteed that you can get your existing .com URL in .cpa, but you have to do that uh, by the end of this month. A lot of information about this at domains.cpa. So we do have some time here, so let's bring uh, Barry and Mark back up. And uh, Lisa, you and I um, uh, can can you know ask some questions. I'll I'll just hit one real quickly, and then and then you can ask the next question. It's a good question. People saying I want to share these town halls uh, with others. Can I do that? Absolutely. Um, every one of these town halls uh, are available on AIC, AICPA TV in the AICPA YouTube channel. Um, you know, two or three hours after uh, after the event. And you are welcome uh, to share that with anybody. Uh, so, Lisa, I'll let you uh, ask the next question here. Thanks, Eric. Can I ask a question of myself? Yes. Um, <laughs> get, I'm getting this question a, a little more frequently these days, which is, can a borrower elect to only use payroll funds when they apply for forgiveness? So, they, can they ignore any rent costs or any utility costs? And um, the answer is, you can use whatever costs you want to apply for forgiveness. You don't, you're not compelled to use non-payroll if um, using only payroll gets you to that full forgiveness amount. Um, what we don't know yet is what process will a lender use with borrower to clear up any um, question. So if you accidentally put the owner in um, at with no limitation, will the lender give you an opportunity to correct that. So that's your downside of uh, only using payroll. You got to be really sure that you've got the right payroll cost. Well, Lisa, I'll just, another question. A lot of these questions, this is where a tool will come will come in handy. It said, can a PP borrower ignore the fact that they use PPP funds to pay rent to owners and simply use a period of time that is long enough and use, use all, just use payroll to get everything forgiven? The answer is yes. And if you went through the application, you would see that. You would, you would see that uh, you can you can use 
just payroll uh, to have a loan completely forgiven. And with, and with a 24 week period, uh, that, that, that would be possible. So I'm, I'm looking, looking for additional, uh, additional questions. Um, I'm, I'm getting some questions about the FTE safe Harbor number one about operating restrictions. And is there a threshold? Um, again, there is no threshold that's been promulgated in the IFRs or FAQs. What we have is um, a conversation that said, we intend this to be um, a very liberal application. So they expect that many borrowers who were forced to close because of operating restrictions will qualify. So Mark Peterson, here's a question for you. And it's something we were even gonna put in, in the resources. Uh, you know, can, can they get a link to the existing PPP bill? Uh, you know, the, the, the existing skinny heels bill. So and sure, quick sure. resources to reference. We, we, we can definitely get that out. Um, there are, you know, 87 page summary. We got a couple thousand pages of legislative text. I will just say though, if this becomes law, it's going to change. So what we give you is what they're talking about. And it is one side of the negotiation. If it's going to happen, it will change. Having said that and trying to be positive, there's tons to like inside these bills of things that we're looking for that we want. What they're fighting over on the top end is the size of the bill, you know, 1.5 trillion or 2.2. Uh, and then big things like the amount of money going into uh, state and local fr from the feds or things like liability. Um, but underneath that, you know, there's a lot that is helped, at least as a directional guidance. Barry, I have, a qu I have a question for you about, I'm going to take this one real quickly. It's about the lending community. They said the lending community, are they, we're hearing that banks are not going to be taking PPP2 loans. I mean, there's fatigue out there. I think, so I think it's good for firms uh, to have a, have a plan B. I think the lending community is, 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 is going to stand up um, and, and support this. And I think it's, it's important uh, for, for, the, for the firms as well. So Barry, there was just some questions on, you know, what, you know, what, what is AICPA advocating for? Uh, really, I mean, you covered it a little bit, but maybe you know, share some additional comments on, you know, some of our key positions here that we've been we've been pushing uh, related to this latest act. Well, it starts with support for a PPP two to help small business. Uh, the deductibility issue is clearly at the top of that. Um, you know, the, the, there's a multi-state taxation issue that um, is probably not going to be in this bill, unfortunately, but we've been pushing for that. And that makes it, um, we would say, unnecessarily complex for taxpayers and practitioners as we get into, you know, the, tw the fi 2021 filing of 2020 tax returns. Uh, those are some of the major points. We, we've supported a simplified process for forgiveness, particularly on the low end of the uh, of the um, of the PPP one loans, uh, and uh, we've actually supported for at least smaller 501c sixes support in that environment as well. Uh, we think that that's a big part of the economy, uh, particularly in the various states. That it's a big part, probably not appropriate for national organizations, but probably appropriate for state-based organizations. That's great, Barry. So, uh, I mean, for th that summary, thank you. And Barry, thank you for being with us. We absolutely, we, we like having Barry at least once a month on uh, these town halls. I know you appreciate being with uh, this audience. And all of these questions that you ask, uh, we do take them back. We look at them and they, they help drive uh, the FAQs. So Barry, if you want to sign off, then I'm going to give a, I got a couple more slides. We're right, we're right at the wall though. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great job by the team that is Hopefully our members really uh, understand that our team has been really focused on the members and the small business. And from a profession perspective, that's the key. Thank you all. Thanks. So let's just go to these final resource slides and then talk about next week. Uh, this is the, the, uh, the, the resource center, AICBA.org backslash SBA. Again, this has been a big request. So starting next week, you are going to be uh, registered for the series. You can opt out, uh, but we're registering all the attendees, AICPA member attendees for the series. And what we recommend you do is we, you leverage this link in your email to add uh, this webinar event to either Outlook, your Outlook calendar or Google calendar. 
So you'll be receiving an email about this on Monday. So hopefully that will make the, your viewing uh, experience better because it'll be an easier process to sign up. Next week, uh, we've got Congresswoman Fletcher with us. We also have Renee Lassert, who's the founder and CEO of Bill.com, and he's played a huge role for the profession. If for some reason, uh, the bill has passed, we may modify uh, next week a little bit so we can do a deep dive on the bill. Uh, thank you very much for your time this week. We look forward to seeing you next week and do also stay tuned for any announcements on our LinkedIn and Twitter sites. Thank you very much.